this evening, um, we're going to do uh, Russian language, literature, and civilization. Did everybody get a, a handout? Everybody have a handout? Excellent. Okay. Um, the map on back is not very good, but it's difficult to make. Did you need one? Milo, do you have, do you have any more? Milo? Yeah. Do you have your hand up, ma'am? There we go, right there. Um, the map is, is not very, it turns out it's difficult to get a good copy of a map, so I apologize, but we'll be using that a lot, so, so be prepared. Um, right, so tonight's Russian language, literature, and civilization, and it's part of the language and literature series that I've been doing now for uh, a year, many of you have attended, um, but I thought it would be good to introduce the topic again. The idea comes from a book by uh, Nicholas Oster, um, he's a linguist, and he wrote a book called The Empire of the Words, in which he says, we study history by ethnic groups and by economic development and by military force. But he said one of the most profound elements of culture is, of course, language. It binds people together, it makes a tradition, and it's always living. That's what a, li a language has to be spoken and used to be alive. And so he said, you know, we really should look at languages as a unifying intellectual historical concept rather than some of the other structures. At least it might be fruitful. And I thought, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Let's do that. How hard could it possibly be? Uh, yeah. So here we are. Uh, and so the idea, again, is to sort of try and explore the history, the development, where the language comes from, the influences that have been on that language, and what has flowed from that language out to us and the, and the world today. So sort of the mark, the impression that the language has made and, and is making today, if it's a living language. Most languages we've, we've looked at are, are living languages. So Russian. Um, Russia, Russian is a new language. Um, it's roughly the same age as English. Uh, depending on how you count Latin, a little younger than French, or, or a lot younger, depending on how you score the Latin. Curiously, though, we need to start with um, Russian with the Swedes. So around the 8th and 9th century, this interesting phenomenon happened where the, we call them the Vikings, the Normans, you know, various names between where they came. They, they headed out into the world with their, with their very highly developed for the time, technologically advanced longboats, and they had a wide variety of these, not just the famous ones that we always think of as Viking warships. They had a bunch. They were very good shipbuilders, sort of cutting edge, cutting edge technology for their day. Uh, and one place they came down to is into what were the Slavic countries. Now, the Slavic peoples had been known as far back as ancient Greece. Uh, and like almost everything the ancient Greeks talked about that wasn't Greek, they had nothing good to say about them. They were sort of the cannibal evil people over there who you don't want to deal with because we don't like them because they don't speak Greek, right? So that was, you know, the rest of the world, except for the Egyptians. The rest of the world sort of was third rate at best. Um, but there's no writing. So this is one of those long, you know, tradition of peoples in this area but no, they, they had no writing, and so we don't have a, a literary culture for, for a very long time. But about the 8th, 9th century, the, the Vikings sort of head out. They go all over the place, but one of the places they head to is, is the rivers of modern Russia. Of course, there's no Russia at the time. Uh, the Dnieper, the Don, and the Volga in particular. And first they just row in, and they sort of, it's hard to know exactly. It was a mix between trading stealing slaves, pillaging, and extorting tribute, right? So whatever you want to call that, sort of modern capitalism, I think is what we call that. Uh, but but you know, sort of, you know, here we are, we're a lot of us in this boat, give us your shit or we'll hurt you, or hey, we'll trade for that, or, you know. So this sort of develops, right? This rolls along for a while, and then they start settling. Uh, they start to establish settlements. So like 860, I just sort of picked this as a random date, uh, the the Volga, Volga Vikings are, are busy starting settlements. The early one, earliest, one of the earliest ones is Kiev in modern Ukraine. Um, and they, they built, basically it was a fortified trading post, very much like there are images of the Old West where they would put forts with the posts, you know, all around. And then if, if bad things came, you put all your material goods inside. And when they, but they were sort of ship repair posts, trading posts, um, and settlements. And so they start to intermarry, 
They, start, they stop thinking of themselves as Swedes out on sort of a vacation and more as, you know, the people here, this is our permanent land. Um, and they bring the Gothic language, which it has very heavy influence on the, on the Slavic language of the time, and they start to mix. And then they enter the historical record. We have archaeological record of all this, but we don't have any written records. But they enter the historical record because they trade both with the Byzantine Empire in Constantinople and with the Arabic Empire in, in Baghdad. And so sort of the officials who are in charge of controlling trade in these places say, oh, well, these new people have shown up, the Rus. And we're not sure where the word Rus comes from, but it seems to be, that, or the speculation is, this is very loose, that it's the name, the Swedish name of the place where some of the, the original Vikings came from, translated into Finnish, and then shortened into Old Slavic. <laughs> right? And so they, but this is what they called themselves. So the, the, both the Arabic and the, and we, so we have an Arabic and we have it in Greek, because Constantinople at this time, of course, is in Greek, uh, or speaking Greek. And so we have the records in, in both languages at the same time. Now, if you look at a map, um, I, I couldn't quite get all of it in there, but this is a huge trading route. This is overland, down rivers, across the Caspian Sea, or across the Baltic, across the Azure Sea, you know, multiple rivers, many cataracts, unload load ships. Um, pretty good records that it took them about 11 months to make the trip. So this is, this is a, a really huge, sophisticated, dynamic undertaking from, say, Kiev, to Constantinople or Baghdad, right? It, it, it was months and months or years to, to make this trip. And so this wasn't like a simple raiding party or sort of backward guys who got together with a boat and headed out. No, these are sophisticated, highly advanced for the time uh, people. And this was recognized both, both in the Arab world and in, in Constantinople where they're like, wow, these guys seem to, you know, they have their act together. We want to deal with them. We want to trade with them. Um, important date, in 900 roughly the capital is established in Kiev, there's, there's lots of digs in the Kiev, archaeological digs in the Kiev area, they find lots of silver minted Arabic coins, they find all kinds of relics from the Byzantine Empire there, and so this is one way they know what's going on. Um, right around 1000 AD, I mean, uh, yeah, AD, there is some trouble in the Arabic world, and there's these people called the Hazars. We can't really go into them, but they sort of block the trade route to the Arabs. And this is one of the major turning points in, in, in the history of, of what becomes Russia. Because when that trade route is blocked, the only thing that's really left is Constantinople. And so the shift, the emphasis, which before was going both ways, you sort of hang a right and go down the Dnieper and end up in Constantinople. You hang a left, you go down the Volga to the Azure Sea to the Caspian Sea, and you kind of end up eventually in Baghdad. Uh, with the one trade route closed off, they start to form closer relations with the Byzantine Empire. Um, and in 990, Vladimir I, Vladimir world conqueror, owner of the world, the world leader, uh, Vladimir I sets up shop. Um, he marries the sister of the reigning uh, bishop of, sort of the archpatriot of um, Constantinople and converts to Orthodox Christianity. This, this is the, the significance here, you cannot overstate this because historically this could have gone any number of directions. They could have stayed indifferent. They could have just said, you know what, we're fine. We're going to just split the difference and stay, you know, pagan, whatever you want to call it at the time. They could have gone Arab. If, if the trade route is cut to Constantinople, perhaps they go, oh, well, we want to trade with, um, you know, Baghdad with the Arab world. They've, they were a very advanced civilization at the time. So, hey, let's convert. It was clear the conversion was, you know, totally political and, and business oriented at the time. But it's a conversion that really stuck. And so now you get Greek brought into this, this society. And this is called, and they come up with a new language called Old Church Slavonic, still used today in the Byzantine liturgy. 
a thousand years later. So if you go to the Byzantine uh, Russian uh, church today, Orthodox Church in Russia, the liturgy will be in Old Church Slavonic, which was a, a, a Mongols one. It was a combined language. They took some of the Slavonic elements, they took some of the Greek elements, they took some Gothic elements, and they came up with versions of the Bible, versions of the liturgy, versions of the lives of the saints, and started bringing that in uh, to the area around Kiev, basically, is where this, because the, uh, Kiev is where this conversion takes place, where Vladimir is based. And it starts to spread out, but not quickly, and this is important to remember, very slowly. But the first literacy in the, the, what would become Russia was from the Greek Empire. It was a Byzantine, it was Byzantine literature translated into basically a hybrid language so that they could bridge the gap between the Slavonic languages, Old Slavonic, that was spoken, the vernaculars, for a non-literate culture. There was, they basically, they weren't literate. Um, one of the earliest, I think the earliest written version of this is, is called the um, Novogorod Codex, which I mentioned there, which is a wax writing tablet that people would use to do exercises and write things down, and then they could erase it and write again. This, 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 they dug this up only about 10 years ago um, around Kiev. And, but be, through the magic of modern palimpsest technology, palimpsest is where you scrape off one text and write another text over the top, and it scrapes that off, write another text. Well, they discovered layer after layer after layer after layer here. And so they have all kinds of, they have examples of someone practicing the language. They have different uh, prayers, different sermons, different uh, religious texts there. And so, so it's hugely valuable, it's sort of you know, given a great insight earlier than we had before. But so you have a Slavonic language that's spoken in all kinds of crazy dialects, right? Because there's no standardization coming from a written version. From the outside, from the Byzantine civilization, you have coming in a new language, Old Church Slavonic, which is laid over the other language. But as is often the case, sort of in, in medieval Christianity, the only people who really learn that language to read it or write it are the monks, the priests, the scholars of which there's a, 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 a few, but not a lot, particularly at the early days. And so the spread of the language is very slow. It takes a long time to begin to absorb them. Um, and so Kiev is extending its authority along the rivers. Byzantine Christianity, Orthodox, Russian Orthodox today, Christianity is spreading. And trade is expanding. It starts to go back to the Arab world, sort of the Hazar thing gets worked out, and so they're going back that way. And then the Mongols show up. <laughs> well, so the Mongols, yes. And as they were wont to do, they came in and smashed everything, took what they wanted, and then they left. Now, this is important to note about the Mongols. In most of the areas, not everywhere because they were all over the place, but in most of the areas, Russia in particular, they did not settle. Unlike the, the, the Vikings, the Swedes who come down, mixed with the population, sort of, you know, this is the seeds of Russia, they came in, smashed, burned, destroyed, took money, went away and said, you have to keep paying us tribute. And so the nobles of the Russians would have to travel to the court of the Khans. And any time they did this, by the way, they made out their wills. <laughs> Because, man, when you got there, you did not know what was waiting for you. They might just cut your head off. Right? And, and it's, by the way, it's important to remember as we look at the history, because we have this notion of Russia, you know, this sort of imperialist monster that's constantly invading, you know, the south and, you know, sort of trying to come. Well, imagine Mexico had invaded us for 300 years and just continually killed and pillaged. As soon as we got the chance, we'd be like, well, that's it. We're stomping Mexico. Right? We took Texas with no provocation, right? We just sort of made up a provocation and took it. But, but it was a very logical idea from their history to say, holy crap, the Mongols, we don't want them back. We've got to create a buffer in that direction, which we'll see. So for about 250, 300 years, the Mongols are running the place, but at a distance. They don't mess around too much. They don't care if you're an Orthodox Christian, which, which increasing percentage of the population is, as long as you pay your tribute, do what they say, life is good. 
So then right around, because all these dates are rough, right around the 1400s, um, you get Ivan III, Ivan the Great, and Ivan IV, Ivan the Terrible. I like to think of them as Ivan the Terribly Great and Ivan the Greatly Terrible. That's the, <laughs> that's the way to think of those two Ivans. Um, and what has happened is the Moscow princes have been in the courts of the Khans, and they've been the best maneuverers. And they've managed to shift power from Kiev to Moscow. And so when Ivan III and IV are able to throw off, and, and it's really Ivan IV that completes this. I mean, it takes like you know, 80, 100 years to do this. It doesn't happen overnight. It's like one big battle and we're free. Um, they've con not only thrown off the Mongols, they've consolidated much of the power in Moscow, where it will stay until the establishment of St. Petersburg, which is you know, a ways away. There are a few brief interruptions, but basically that's what happens. Um, and they do this in various ways, but what's important to note is this sets up the structure of Russian society that will exist for basically until the revolution. Um, and that is that you have an isolated, centralized authority that exerts influence over this huge land but the focus is no longer on rivers and external trade, but when they shifted to Moscow, they also shifted focus to the land. You start to look to Siberia, you start to look south, you start to look west, but less interest in reaching out along the rivers and the sea trade, a very different mindset, more agrarian, mining, forestry is wealth, not trade with the, the Arabs and, and the Byzantines so much. It's a very different mindset. The French did, the Franks did a very similar thing. Forget the Mediterranean, we're looking at the agricultural crops of the inland when, when sort of the Mediterranean world collapses. And so this starts to shape the outlook. They look <coughs> agrarian, local, expanding towards Siberia begins, and some tentative reaching out to the south. But almost nobody is literate. It's a huge country, even at this time, before mass conquest in Siberia. And so what happens when you have limited literacy, a large country, not very densely populated? It turns out that, and this is, Russia's not the only example, but historically this often creates very strong centralized authority. Because if you're in the middle-ish, and somebody's out in a village here, who do they team up with to throw you off? Almost nobody, because there's nobody around. And so these distances and the difficulties of communication created a strong central, but then of course loosely effective bureaucratic system, which has been sort of the hallmark of Russian rule, of really strong, powerful central authority that really doesn't have that much control. <laughs> this is interesting and, 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 you know, sort of tension there because all of, for the rest of the history, every European court ambassador that goes to the, the Moscow would say, wow, this guy has absolutely total authority in theory. Once you leave Moscow, well, it sort of, sort of diminishes the further and further and further you get away because, you know, when it snows, it's often impassable. In spring, it's muddy, it's impassable. In fall, it's muddy, it's impassable. <laughs> And so it's hard to exert that authority. So the authority was very personally invested. My friend goes someplace distant and rules basically in my stead. So it was difficult to develop also is another one. Uh, again, at the time people kept saying, oh, why is not Russia developing? Why is it backwards? Peter the Great, who we're about to get to, would say this. Well, if you're in Paris and you need to build a road to Le Havre, to have a port where you can distribute your goods, it's about 100 miles. If you're in Moscow and you want to go to, I don't know, Riga or say Odessa, it's about 500 miles. It's a much longer road and much crappier weather. So it would take vastly more resources to create the same level of, of capacity. And so they were struggling with this throughout their history. And people go, oh, why are the Russians backward? Oh, they're you know, Slavic people or they're Asiatics or all these sort of racist concepts. No, it's because they had a thousand miles of mud to dig through. 
And that's hard digging, you know, basically. Oh, they're wildly disorganized. Well, it's easy to disor be organized when you're small. It's hard to be organized when you're huge and sparsely populated. They're more like Alaska than like New York City. Right? This is a very different outlook. Um, so they've thrown off the yoke of the Mongols, still literacy, tiny fraction of the society. In 1850, only 10% of Russians were literate, give or take. So we're, we're not even close to 1850, right? We're still back here at 1600s. So very slow rate of literacy because of the agrarian focus of the society. You know, 90% of the people are peasants. Well, then you get Peter the Great and Catherine, basically. It's sort of a long reign between the two. And both of them turn to the West. And they say, we want to be more like the Western powers. We want to be great like them. We want to be rich. We want to be powerful. So we're going to model ourselves on what they're doing. And so you got these huge influxes of two influences. One French in the aristocracy, of course. And the other is German. Because they import a lot of German engineers, businessmen, traders, technical people. To, to sort of train, work, build, design, create a new Russia. And so you have this interesting mix where you have the population speaking wide varieties of old Slavic, new Slavic, Russian, whatever you want to call it. You have the literate Russians reading primarily Old Church Slavonic, which is a language no one ever spoke, and is used primarily for the distribution of religious texts, well, primarily, almost solely. You have a few of the aristocracy who've developed a sort of new Slavonic written language, which begins to spread. And then you have this mass influx of French and German literacy, all simultaneously. This is all going on at once. So, it, it, so, it's, a biz, right? so it's this bizarre cultural mishmash. And again, almost everybody else is illiterate. Right? So, but the people who are literate are sort of torn three or four ways. Uh, and so spoken language is, is probably very, and the evidence suggests in places hugely diversion, divergent from the various written languages, certainly from French and German. So Peter the Great you know, famously establishes his, his capital in St. Petersburg, and he says, I want to be more like the enlightened rulers to the West. So... All you serfs are going to die building a capital in a swamp, right? This is it's one of these great sort of, uh, they had the sort of concept of what was going on, but not the heart of it, right? He was like, okay, I'm going to be Western, and I don't know how many people I have to kill to get there. Uh, so it was that interesting, interesting mix. And Catherine the Great extends this. She was a Francophile. She spoke French fluently. Her court spoke French. They loved the French. They were all about the French, French this, French fashion takes over. But again, teeny tiny percentage of the aristocracy has gone desperately Francophile. Some of the reactionary aristocracy has said, no, Russian, old church, that's what we do. We are not French. Screw the French. We don't like the French. We don't want the Enlightenment. Catherine was so Francophone, basically, that when she heard that... Um, the king of France might repress the, the encyclopedists, Diderot and company. She offered to protect them. I will house you. Come to Russia. You can print freely. You can publish it. Which on one hand sounds very liberal, which I guess sort of it was. On the other hand, none of her subjects spoke French, so it has no impact, right? So <laughs> if the, the encyclopedists were very much more revolutionary in a country where people spoke French than they would be in Russia, right? Where it didn't matter. But... This was her outlook. This was her concept. Oh, great things are going on in France. Bring them here. Um, and then Napoleon invaded, right? Napoleon happened. Uh, Russia had become a player in European affairs, very interested in it, um, negotiating their ambassadors. They became a European power. People say, oh, is Russia really part of Europe? Which I always think is like saying, well, is Europe really part of Russia? See, we never ask that. We don't say, is Europe a part of Russia? Because, you know, I don't know, it, it, it's a weird question. But there's no doubt that for several centuries, Russia was a major, important, significant European power. Several centuries, of course, up to today. Um, 
And so they, they're playing the great game, negotiating. Their ambassadors are going all over the world. They're being consulted, primarily because Napoleon is such a danger. And so the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is terrified of Napoleon, Prussians, and Russia form this alliance with England to try and keep Napoleon under wraps. And everybody but England, of course, safely on their island, fall. They all fail, except Russia. Who's still standing? The Russians are. And so Napoleon brilliantly decides, I'll invade Russia. What could possibly go wrong with that? <laughs> of course, famously, everything went wrong with that, right? Plague, starvation, cold, et cetera, et cetera. The beginning of the end. This is the destruction of the Napoleonic regime, thanks to the Russians. And what the Russians took away from this is a couple of things important for their language and cultural and civilization development. One, we're better than the West. The West failed. They need to adopt our model of civilization. Who stood up Napoleon? Wasn't the French. They let him take him over. It wasn't the Prussians, wasn't the Austro-Hungarians, wasn't the British. They couldn't have done anything without us. We won. We're better. Orthodox Christianity is better. Our governing system is better. The courage, the power, the might of the Russian people is greater than anything Europe has. Russia transcendent. Which makes total sense, right? Because they won. Uh, and so while they still stage heavily engaged in Europe, by the way, the concert of Europe was built at this time. Metternich, Castle Rock, uh, the ambassadors negotiating this. An alliance between Austro-Hungarian Empire and, and Russia and Prussia primarily to say no more revolutions. We're emperors, we're monarchs, we're divine right rulers. Our civilization has triumphed, we must keep all of the other people down. While all this has been happening, this has happened several times by the way, as early as 1400, the, Ivan IV, um, the greatly terrible, um, had announced himself the leader of the Holy Roman Empire via Byzantium. Byzantium. When, when Constantinople falls, where's the last Greek Orthodox capital in the world? Moscow. Moscow is the new Rome. An unbroken heritage to the ancient world. See, we think, oh, well, the Latin to the French to the, the... No, 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 no. It goes, you know, the Greeks to the Greeks, the Greek priests to the Russian Orthodox Church. That, that's, this is the unbroken lineage from the ancient world that lands in Moscow. We never think of that, do we? No, oddly. Turns out that many of the Russian leaders thought about this a lot. <laughs> And when they sort of won the Napoleonic Wars, they started thinking, you know what? It's time to liberate Constantinople. It's time to reunify the Byzantine Empire, which we lead from Moscow. And this is both a mix of political and religious drive. But it's also mixed with the influence of German and French philosophy and literature. And so you get the Crimean War as sort of a result of all the po politics following the fallout of the Napoleonic War and an attempt by Russia and other people to control the Holy Land. It's unbelievably complex. Byzantine is the exact word we use, as that everyone's trying to take over like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, right? That, like the Orthodox priests were there armed and beating people up, and they were because it was about reestablishing Orthodox Christianity in Constantinople, liberating it from the heathens, from the Arabs, after centuries of enslavement and making a continuous Byzantine empire from Moscow to the Levant. It's a grand dream. Um, this didn't work out, because during the Crimean War, well, the, Russia found out that they didn't really, weren't doing that well. They were, they were shown to be lacking intellectually, technologically, organizationally. Their ideals failed, and, and the Tsar Nicholas at the time recognized this immediately. And there was a lot of soul searching. One of the things they said is, you know what? We've got to liberate the serfs. This is what we need to do. And so they got the leaders together and they negotiated 
the freeing of the serfs. It happens in 1851. And again, if you read the histories, there's this idea that, oh, you know, those backward Russians, with all their millions of serfs suffering away um, in 1851, how terrible is that? Well, it was five years before we freed the slaves, <laughs> who were very much worse off than the serfs, and we had to fight a horribly vicious, bloody civil war to pull it off the repercussions of which are still felt in our country this day. And the slaves in America were very much worse off than almost all of the serfs in Russia. And yet again, we have this idea, oh, they had serfs. What a what horrible, backwards, terrible people. That's ridiculous. I mean, I'm not in favor of serfdom, but we had slaves, which was a worse institution by far. And so the, the liberalization of the country is taking place. The influence of the French ideals of, of parliamentary democracy is starting to flood out. And this is when you get the incredible literary explosion that happens. It starts in the late 17th century, a little trickle. You get the 18th century, starts to grow more. And then you get the flood. All of a sudden, after centuries, of basically, no one knew that Russians ever wrote anything. 1850s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, everybody goes, holy crap. They've got some writers over there. They've got some thinkers. They've got philosophers. They have scientists. It was this unleashing of this repressed capacity. Education starts to spread. The czar says, we've got to educate the peasants. We've got to educate our soldiers. We've got to get literate people. And it sets up this tension between the old system, which is no, 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 no. No thinking, no writing, no reading. Old church Slavonic, stick with that. And the new, the new idea of, oh, no, we can engage with thought. We have freedom of the press. We have liberty to think. And you can go through, generation after generation, you have, um, you know, Dostoevsky. He goes to the penal colony. Solzhenitsyn goes to the penal colonies, right? Almost, that's almost a hundred, three generations span. We want writers, they're educated, they're not, oh, not that much. Put them, you know, get rid of them. Okay, bring them back, let them write again. Oh, not too much, go away, right? <laughs> this is this ebb and flow that's been going ever since. But it demonstrated that there was this powerful new language, by the way, and it was a new language, brought to you mostly, of course, by a lot of people, but we can look at one person, it's Pushkin. Pushkin is one of the greatest, or the greatest Russian writer and poet, because he took all of these disparate elements. He took old church Slavonic, he took the dialogue, the, the, the vocabulary of the aristocracy, he took the Slavic dialects, and somehow he made a beautiful language, coherent, powerful, that could communicate across imported French forms, German ideas. All, and, and to craft, and again, the problem is it's, you can't see this in translation. This is one of the things, <laughs> translation is so frustrating for this, because Pushin has pulled off this incredible feat that every, virtually every Russian writer just says, Lermitov, Pushkin, ha. There, Russian appears, you know, sort of whole blown out of the forehead of Zeus. Ah, like, sort of like Shakespeare, right, who sort of takes disparate elements and creates English. But you can't see it in translation, because in translation it just looks like nice English, right? It's like, oh, well, he just did nice English. Well, that's good, because, you know, you don't translate it. I don't know how you would do that in translation, but so we missed that. And so that first generation remakes the language, literally. It, it creates a literary language that did not basically exist before 1650, 1700. It's a new, powerful voice on this world literary scene. And we're fortunate because we're the inheritors of it. And, and if you look there, like I said, I just made a list you know, of a few writers to consider. I, again, how do you do all this? Lermitov, Pushkin, Turgenev, Gogol, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Chekhov, Bloch, Akhmatova, Brodsky, Nabokov, and then the, the Nobel Prize winners, you know, Bunin, Pasternak, Sholokhov, Solzhenitsyn, Brodsky. That's a pretty good list of heavy hitters, and that's just scratching the surface, right? I mean, this is, this is of course, not complete. This is not total. 
And so you get this explosion of incredibly Chekhov, you know, and more. But it has this interesting quality to it. Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Solzhenitsyn, uh, Turgenev, Gogol, Nabokov to a certain extent, you know, they did not like oppression. They didn't want the czars kicking you around. But they hated the West, or at least were incredibly suspicious of us. We think of this thing as, oh, if you don't like the czars, well, then you must like us. And almost invariably, this is not the case with Russian writers. No one knows the problems of Russia better than them, right? They don't want us to lecture them on the problems of their country. This is not helpful. We love to do this, by the way. We love to go around the world and tell people what's wrong with their country. Ah, it's so obvious and so easy to do. But the fact that they could reject both much of their own heritage and say much is great and a hell of a lot better than what you have sort of has infuriated us and baffled us ever since, this explosion. So this is why the, the, the long quote I have here that I start with from Dostoevsky, I'm a sick man, I'm a spiteful man, I'm an unattractive man. I believe my liver is diseased, however, I know nothing at all about my disease, and I do not know for certain that what ails me. I don't consult a doctor for it and never have, though I have respect for medicine and doctors. Besides, I am extremely superstitious, sufficiently so to respect medicine anyway. I am well educated enough not to be superstitious, but I am superstitious. No, I refuse to consult a doctor from spite that you will probably not understand. Well, I understand it though. Of course, I can't explain who it precisely is that I'm mortifying in this case by my spite. I am perfectly well aware that I cannot pay out the doctors by not consulting them. I know better than anyone that by all this, I'm only injuring myself and no one else. But still, if I don't consult a doctor, it is from spite. My liver is bad, well, let it get worse. <laughs> this is the great narrator from Notes from the Underground, from Dostoevsky. If you're not familiar with this book, immediately go read it. It's short, it's wonderful, it's terrifying, it's grand. And it presents in a very slim volume this, this tension. I'm sick, I know medicine might cure me, I don't want to be cured. Screw you. You can't make me. Your answer is not my answer. Um, if, if you look at something like uh, Crime and Punishment from Dostoevsky again, Raskolnikov. By the way, Raskol, a, a Raskolnik, Raskolnikoy is a, um, a religious dissenter. It was, it's a name for churches that broke away from the orthodoxy, uh, which was very common because the orthodox Russian church sort of periodically side would side with the government and then sort of lean away and then would side with the government. And the same thing's happened today with Putin. Putin is, is, is using the uh, uh, Russian Orthodox Church very consciously to help him rule and, and do what he wants to do. And so there's always been these schismatics. And so when you look at a name like Raskolnikov, the main character of Crime and Punishment, what we miss is the fact that his name is Dissenter. Dissension. This is the question, how do you dissent? What does dissent look like? What is the price, crime, dissension, and punishment? Ha ha, it's pretty clear, it's not subtle. Dostoevsky is never subtle. But the opening of that book is, here I am, I'm a great man, I'm educated, I'm a Western man, I know, I don't have, I don't believe in the church, I'm liberated from all that superstition. So why shouldn't I just kill this old woman and steal her money? There's no punishment, there's no heaven or hell. There's no moral laws. I'm a great man. This is what the West teaches. This is what I've learned. And that book is a systematic rejection of this theory. It critiques it from top to bottom. Nothing good about Germans in there, by the way. In fact, you can almost, I don't know if there's a single passage that says anything good about German in all of Russian literature. <laughs> they're there, and they're almost invariably unappreciated. <laughs> Uh, we first run into a German, again, in, in Crime and Punishment, uh, who, because they, a group of Germans have lured a young woman about 14 in to get her drunk and rape her. So this is the kinds of representatives we get of, of people like German, uh, Germany. But also, you know, the, the French. He goes after the French. He hated France. He has great letters from, from he goes to Paris during the Belle Epoque, and we all dream, oh, wouldn't it be wonder to go there? And he writes, 
these just scathing, brutal, terrifying letters home about how awful Paris is. It's the worst place in the world. You wouldn't believe how terrible it is. And we think, oh, that must be wrong. Because we know Paris is great. Ah, not if you're Dostoevsky. And so again, you have this mix. It is a European country. It has been in, in Europe. It produces this beautiful, powerful literary language. And what it expresses in it is, I don't agree with you. <laughs> I think in a lot of ways you're wrong. I'm not saying this is right. I'm not saying the czar is correct. I'm just saying you're not correct either. And this is not, again, isolated to Tolstoy. It's not isolated to Dostoevsky or Turgenev or Chekhov. Uh, most recently, Solzhenitsyn, if people know him as, as a writer. Gulag Archipelago. He was familiar with the problems with the Soviet system on a very first-hand personal basis. So he ends up leaving Russia after all kinds of craziness. They tried to poison him, um, to kill him. And he comes to America, and we think, ha-ha, great dissident writer, lives in America. Yay. Wins a Nobel Prize for literature. Goes back to Russia and is like, man, America is terrible. <laughs> you cannot believe how bad America is. And again, not that Stalin is great. He was not like going, well, wasn't that great? Could we get Stalin back? That would, no, he was like, that was bad too. And so there's this constant tension if you read Russian literature. That, that here's a, a, a civilization, a society, by the way, a young society like us, a polyglot society, lots of people, lots of languages. The Slavs have probably actually never been the majority people in whatever was considered Russian historically. They've always had, you know, whatever the Siberians are, you know, those, those peoples out there, they going to the south to the stands, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, uh, Afghanistan eventually sort of overreached there, had a retreat. Um, but, but as we did, right, never invade Afghanistan, it's clear, don't do that. Um, and, but, this polyglot, young, vibrant, intellectually powerful society, we can't quite get over the notion that they won't agree with us. Their writers are great, but gee, we only tend to read half of what they say. They know our ideas. They know the German philosophy. They know the French philosophy. 18th, 19th, 20th century, this was hugely influential. They know communism is a bad idea. Great, got it. But they tend to be very, very, they reject the Western materialism. This is what they have a problem with, as far as I can tell, primarily. And this comes, again, from this Orthodox Byzantine tradition. Not necessarily the church itself, which is sort of, again, schismatic problems. But with the idea that there is another power here, not materialism, not rational thought. Rational thought is not going to save us. There is something greater, more powerful, uh, more wonderful in human beings than is captured in all of your philosophies, dear Horatio, right? This, this idea that it is out there, it, it is possible. You can live it, you can embody it. Again, if, if you look at Solzhenitsyn, just because he's you know, so recent, this is what he says. He says, you know, I've been in the West. I've lived here for 20, 30 years. I escaped Stalin. I lived in the gulags. I wrote a book called The Cancer War, terrifying. And what I've decided is, Russia's better. For all the flaws, which he knows better than anyone, Russia's better. Another curious element here is throughout its history, Russia, again, has, has either conquered, conquered or, or, or bartered with or traded or been in alliances with huge numbers of Arabic people. Probably makes up 30 to 40 percent of the population at various times. You can find any influence of Arabic, as far as I can tell, on Russian literary or intellectual thought. That, that, has, that influence just hasn't come to predominate. It might. But so far, you just don't see it. Siberia, I don't know what influence it would have, but again, not so much. It's really been the Western and orthodox traditions that have shaped the intellectual literary heritage that we've inherited. And because we think we've got it right, right? We had Catholicism, we had the Protestants, and then we just left all that behind. That's the intellectual theory. 
We think, well, how influential could the church be? It, it's the second largest, Russian Orthodox Church is the second largest uh, Christian domination, denomination in the world. Catholics are one, Russian Orthodox two. In fact, the whole Eastern Orthodox Church has about 300 million people in it, which is to say roughly the population of the United States of America. So it's a big thing. And it's been going on in unbroken succession for you know, almost 2,000 years. And so for us, it's like, oh, well, like, how influential could it be? Well, read, read Tolstoy, read Dostoevsky, read Turgenev, read Gogol, right? It's, it's, it's influential. It's there. And so you have this incredible mix of a young, polyglot, multi-ethnic, diverse society Incredible vibrancy. I mean, the, the, the Russian uh, achievements, you know, obviously, you know, Sputnik, right? That was a bit of a shocker for us because we know those backwards communists don't have a chance. Well, and then, of course, they put Sputnik in the air. We're like, oh, crap. We, we, better, we better do something fast, um, right? Scientific achievement. That, but an influence from the German, from the French, very powerfully both with expatriate communities being educated in those countries for centuries. St. Petersburg, built by an Italian architect on a French plan <clears throat> by Russian serfs. You know? um, and yet, we still have this problem, this core where, they, where, where there seems to be this tension. Where they say, well, they're not really like us, which we mean they aren't doing it right. Right? There's a, the, we say they're not do it like us, but what we mean is they're wrong. <laughs> right? I, I, think, I always think that's the resonance that you get there. They, they don't have it down. Um, and that's, this is, so this is this interesting place where we are today. I sort of fast forward to today. One of the most economically important countries in the world. By the way, our economy should be growing so fast as their economy. It, 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 over the last 15 years, people go, oh, why is Putin so popular? Why does he maintain power? Well, he rigs elections. He runs the secret police and the KGB. And he delivers roughly, you know, 5 to 10% GDP growth a year. Hmm. Well, let me tell you, if we had somebody who was delivering those kind of GDP growth, we wouldn't care what they did. Yes. They would win in a landslide every time. Like, oh, you can't run four times. Oh, yeah, you can. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> Elect him again. As long as we got 10% GDP growth, he's in office for life. Right? That's a good thing to do. You have a lot of tension in the society. Right? We think, oh, they're always on the wrong side. Just today, by the way, coincidentally enough, it turns out that we're working with the Russians to, to, to do, deal with the um, chemical weapons in Syria. Looks like we've got a deal. Why do we have to work with the Russians? Well, because they're a major world power. They sold them. It turns out everybody does, right? I mean, this is a thing where it's a universal agreement. We're all happy to sell you chemical weapons, and then we'll complain that you have chemical weapons, right? It seems to be the, 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 the process that, that you uh, to undergo, right? Um, and people go, oh, it's horrible. They didn't want us to bomb in Syria. Russia was really against that. I go, hmm. Is that horrible? <laughs> I, I don't know if that's a terrible thing. I'm not sure I want us to bomb in Syria either. So I don't think that was that terrible. Right? And so we have this sort of love-hate relationship. On one end, it's clearly, without doubt, one of the most vibrant economic, scientific, literary cultures in the world. Vital to all kinds of negotiations in, in, internationally. Huge investment opportunities. Looks to be going moderately dictatorial under Putin. A little scary. But there they are. Right there. Are they in Europe? We don't know. We can never decide. But the, the, the clear evidence is they aren't going away. Right? The literature isn't going away. The culture, the civilization that they've built, which is clearly unique and in some ways quite different, is not going away. It's been going continuously for over a thousand years. If they pull off the Byzantine Empire thing, then that'll make it like 2,000 years, right? So it is this incredible, wonderful force that doesn't believe us in so many ways. And I think that's incredibly great because it's like someone you can disagree with reasonably. It's like, oh, no, we know. We've experienced. We've had it. I still don't believe you're right. right? We can communicate and disagree on some issues. 
So I think it's a, a, a fascinating element in the world. And finally, I would say, uh, if, if we look around, I mean, in the modern world, where do we see the influence of <coughs> Russia? If you, if you ask Russian literature, the answer is everywhere. It's clear when Dostoevsky, Chekhov, I mean, modern theater in some ways is Chekhov. I mean, it's like everybody went, oh, well, that's how you do theater, <laughs> right? What have we been doing, right? That this is the quote, oh, there it is. Um, the modern psychological novel, where does that come from? <coughs> I mean, there's all these sort of limited examples and, you know, English novel and this and that. No, everybody, when they started getting hold of, like, Dostoevsky, they just triggered it. It blew their minds. Oh, they went, oh, look at that. So complex, so contrary, so irrational, so human, right? So very, very human. If you read... Notes from the underground. If you read War and Peace, Anna, Anna Karen, the characters don't act correctly. They don't act smartly. They don't act in the way they should. They don't act morally often. But by God, they act human. And that notion, or, or, or uh, Tarsus Bulba, the, the, the great novel by uh, Gogol. Has anybody read this? It's a wonderful novel where, where the, uh, the guy just ends up killing his son because he's betrayed the Cossack to the Poles. Poles are bad people, by the way. Uh, he betrays him to the Poles, and he cuts his head off. And you go, and he's a hero. Right? And you think, wow, it's almost the ex it's sort of like the opposite of Lear, where he inadvertently kills his daughter, which is terrible and pathetic. But when you purposely kill your son, wow, that's impressive. <laughs> right? And, and moving, and powerful, and human. So I, I would say, I guess to conclude, I don't know, there's a lot, lot there. Um, it is this incredible force in the world today. The language is still not probably done evolving. When, when Solzhenitsyn goes back to Russia, all the writers commented that his Russian was so pure because it hadn't been contaminated by another 20 years of Soviet bureaucratic speech. <laughs> right? He spoke this great version of Russian. He hadn't got all the sort of the phrases and the, that just cloud your mind and makes it you can't think or write clearly, right? And so, so Russian is not done. The language isn't done, just as English isn't done. Any living language is not done. Um, so yeah, so I would say an incredible, very diverse, ancient, powerful literary and cultural force in the world. And yeah, we're going to be living with them for a long time. So thank you, Russian. Thank <laughs> you.